Um, <clears throat> let me take my proverbial glass of water before I start. <clears throat> Thank you. I was in, listening into the, to the last two presentations and I was fascinated indeed by both of them. <clears throat> but mine is a very different sort of presentation because I have about 20 slides uh, and I'd like to go through them in order to really take you back nearly 100 years in history and run you from there right up to the 1970s when the man I wrote about died, but raise some questions for the contemporary scene as well, because uh, this isn't just an, an exercise in nostalgia. This is because this I, I wrote this biography because the man has something to say to us today, uh, and I just felt it wasn't being said. So uh, let me see whether I can man manage the screen sharing. I've got the screen up, I think, at the moment, but let's see. Um, <clears throat> I'll try and go to title one, which is my one here. Is anyone seeing anything except my own face? <laughs> which is just, just Hitler's cosmopolitan bastard. That's right. It should be that. Count Richard Kudnukelegi and his vision of Europe. Yes. yes that's is that showing? <clears throat> yes, it is. Thank you. Yes. So seeing that, that's absolutely perfect. Thank you. That's the title I've chosen. And I'll briefly explain it. <clears throat> the book is essentially a, a biography of Count Richard Kuden of Kalergi, generally an unknown name, um, but he was called a cosmopolitan bastard by Adolf Hitler. In uh, the third volume of Mein Kampf, he expanded quite a lot, spent, expended quite a lot of energy describing what he thought was wrong with Kuden of Kalergi and his vision of Europe. Now, it's interesting to ask why he did that, but uh, it doesn't really matter for the moment. What matters is that that's the title, the, the insult he launched to Kudenhub Kalegi, and it's what we use for uh, introducing the book and catching attention. The reason that Hitler um, spent this energy on talking about this man whom now most people don't know about here, certainly not in the English-speaking world, was that in the 1920s, uh, Kudenhof Kalergi and what he founded, which was a movement called Pan Europa, was a serious challenger to the Nazis. Uh, Hitler set up the National Socialist Party in the early 1920s, and the Count set up Pan Europa in 1924. Uh, at that time, the racist German, if you like, and the cosmopolitan European were literally rivals, rivals for public opinion, for the hearts and minds of the German people and of other Europeans. And the reason why they were fighting each other was this. This is the map that we recognize quite a lot of, but which was extraordinarily new to people at the time of the end of the First World War. All those countries on the right, from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Romania, and Romania did exist. Um, Hungary wasn't a separate state, Czechoslovakia didn't exist. All that patch is totally new. They're all new nations created out of the settlement at Versailles. Uh, after the 1918 war. Uh, and that disturbance, if you like, that, that reassertion of national identity for nearly half the states of Europe is what we are used to. It's what now makes up the membership of the EU. All those, almost, <coughs> not quite all, but almost all those, are what have come into the EU in the intervening generations. But the, <coughs> the world in which the man I'm going to talk to you about grew up was a world in which there were only three or four big empires in Eastern Europe. There was a big German one which went all the way up the coast through the Baltic states. There was the vast Austro-Hungarian one which took the whole middle space and came down some way in the Balkans. There was the remains of the Ottoman Empire in the southern Balkans and there was the Russian Empire. Now, at least the Russian Empire until 1917, obviously the Soviet um, Revolution then, the Bolshevik Revolution changed the nature of that and Russia lost in that part of the war to Germany. Germany imposed a very harsh peace on the Russians uh, that pushed them back. But when Germany then, all those Baltic states were created and Poland was put into place where it had never been for more than 100 years, nearly 200 <coughs> So this map is in fact a revolutionary map to that generation. To us, it's what we're used to. And that's the first point I want to make to you. And the reason why Kudenhof Kalergi then wrote this book, Pan Europa, uh, was because 
he didn't like the idea of there being all these nations having the same sort of battles that nations had when they had a neighbor, a neighbor and a border. The more borders you have, the more risk of war you have, the more conflicting interests you had. We just had the whole explicit problem of Northern Ireland spelt out for us. Uh, a border is what people are trying to get rid of in our generation. We don't want them. We don't want anything which will disturb security inside Europe. The last thing we want is that. Brexit, for that reason, is a walking disaster. Uh, we have unilaterally created a border in the Channel. There's a secondary border up the northern, up the Irish Sea, but that's the, the main issue from a British point of view, an English point of view, is that the new border is in the Channel. And that's something we haven't had, not since 1970s we haven't had, and psychologically we haven't wanted since 1945. Um, the last time we had borders in the Channel, you know, bombers were going either way. Uh, serious borders in the channel. So that's the, the first big point I want to make is the change between the years in which this man, Kudenu Kalegi, grew up. He was a student in the First World War and why he wrote this book, uh, which was to react to the revolutionary changes to the map of Europe that he was living in the middle of. And he was living then in Vienna. Um, that piece, the 1918 piece, was dictated by the four winning powers. That was America, Britain, France, and Italy. Uh, and the Versailles treaties imposed that on the other side, who thought they'd signed an armistice, which was what we technically call it, but in fact was a surrender. Uh, that's a big difference. Psychologically, there was a lot of antipathy to the Versailles settlement because the Germans and the Austrians weren't in on doing it. It was dictated to them. And the publics initially thought that they had signed an armistice to stop the war. Neither of them been, had been overrun. Neither of them had had their capital occupied. It wasn't like the Second World War on the fall of Berlin. Very far from it. These were working societies still in great economic strain, but they were still working political and economic societies that signed the armistice. Uh, but they had the peace imposed on them uh, for very good reasons. Let's not go into all of that now, but um, it created, as I say, problems in the eyes of those who, like the Count, Count Kuden who Kalergi, saw more borders as a negative rather than more borders as the good sense of self-determination, national consciousness, the right thing. Um, and this book that he published in 1923, it may look quite small and nondescript as it were from the outside, but it has inside it absolutely dynamite. And this is one of the things it has inside it, which is another way of looking at the world that people then simply were not looking at the world like this. He's looking at this as a world of power centers, what we would call superpowers, uh, but he called them power centers. If you look down the left-hand side, you've got the Americas, leave off Canada for the moment, but the Americas, which had already an organization, a fairly weak, loose organization called Pan America. It had its own institutions. It had a court of justice for sorting out border, internal border problems. And the Americans, who were by far the dominant power there, had the Monroe Doctrine, which kept the European powers out of the Americas. Then you had away on the right, of course, the Soviet Union, which is a new power, a new boy on the block, 1917. But they had a civil war, which carried on well into the early 20s. It wasn't before let's say the end of 21, before the Soviet Union was emerging from its civil war. And Lenin founded very quickly the Comintern, the international, the communist international, to be the foreign policy unit instrument, if you like. It was any link to the communist parties across the world was through the Comintern. So it was the, the point of agitation from the new Soviet Union to anywhere in the world where he could disturb the balance of other superpowers. One of the first big things that he undertook to do was to create this and to staff it and finance it quite generously. Then there was <clears throat> another quite obvious power center, which we don't see so physically on the map. But if you look at the offshore islands off Europe, that's Britain. And at that time, Ireland still was before, um, before the uh, independence of the southern part of Ireland, uh, that was part of the British Empire. And the British Empire was spread all over the world. In fact, it was in terms of population and in terms of wealth, the equivalent, if not greater, 
then the other two that we've mentioned, certainly uh, wealth, we had a bit of a problem. The Americans were more wealthy by the end of the war in terms of the state's balance sheet. But in terms of background resources, the British Empire was up there with the top power brokers. Uh, you can see most of the eastern and southern part of Africa, all of India, Australia, Canada, all that is part of the great British Empire, and no one's talking about a commonwealth. I mean, you know, that, that is a much later development in thought. This is the empire, okay? It includes dominions, and the dominions are being given British status, as to say their citizens are also citizens of the British Empire. Um, but the, the, the ruling, the running of this place is still essentially out of London. It's not until well into the 30s that we get the Ottawa Agreements, which give enough independence, dare I say, to New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and Canada. Uh, that gives us a more diffuse view, which we now have, as it were, our more recent history of Britain and its empire. Uh, there's, of course, a much more recent one and all of that decolonization, which has totally changed this map. But the point of this is to say that here is Kudinov Kalegi saying what really matters is not individual new states in Eastern Europe. Forget that. The dynamite he's putting in the debate is saying, watch it. If Britain, if Europe is not one of the superpowers, whose breakfast will we be? Will we be an American breakfast or Russian breakfast? Will we maintain? rule over Africa, rule over the Middle East. He even has a question mark. If you look very closely at Turkey there, Turkey has a question mark on it. But that's really the point he's saying. He's talking geopolitics and he's saying, why is Europe not a player? Why is it the chessboard and not one of the, the players? And that is totally new in the way people thought and spoke about Europe at the time. But it's remarkably close to what we're talking about now when we talk about the EU and complain, as I do somewhat, um, that it doesn't have the status of the superpowers. It is still a superpower in, in Spain, hopefully a superpower. It has elements of it. It has some elements of a common currency, not all members. It has some elements of a foreign policy, not followed clearly by all members, not necessarily led all the time by the central authority, often led by the greater nations within the EU. Uh, it's divided. It's just go back as far as Iraq, closely, clearly divided on a big policy, foreign policy issue. Uh, it sometimes speaks with not always one tongue about Russia. There are mixed interests about relationships with Russia. And now China, which is, dare I say, meddling, is certainly has the chance to meddle and to divide one element of the union from another uh, with the interests, the economic interests, which are state controlled, obviously from China, but are not state controlled from Europe. It's an uneven playing field in that respect. So those are the, the big thoughts at the very beginning of this whole thing. And unless we get those big ideas in our mind, I think we'll misunderstand the, dare I say, the rest of the story of this man. Here he is with this revolutionary idea of way of looking at Europe saying, perish, or unite rather, or you will perish. That is really his message. It's the title of one of his books, Unite or Perish. Um, not unfortunately translated into English, I believe, but I'm not quite sure on that one. Uh, but here is the next picture, <coughs> which is um, the result of his publishing this book. And it's not just a book that sinks without trace. It's a book which is picked up by the liberal press, reviewed all over the place, condemned by the Nazis, condemned by the communists. Uh, it's a talking point for several years, uh, immediately translated into every language in Europe. Um, and politicians take note. And he sets up alongside being a pub, being a, publishing his own book, effectively, uh, he sets up a think tank come pressure group called the Pan-European Union. And it has its first big Congress here, which is giving this mass picture for you in the great concert hall in Vienna in 1926. And the great and the good of Europe all flock to it. Um, Einstein is there, Freud is there, Thomas Mann is there. Um, they get the uh, last democratic prime minister of Russia, uh, Alexander Kerensky, to speak. Uh, obviously, the Count Kudenhov Kalergi himself speaks. Um, foreign minister this, uh, prime minister that are all there speaking over three days to the assembled Congress in Vienna. No wonder that Hitler is worried that there's something else happening that isn't the equivalent of the Beer Hall Putsch. And may I say the Beer Hall Putsch took place 10 days after Kudenhoop published his book, Pan Europa, back in 1923. At the end of that year, 
is the Bill Putsch. The end of October is the publication of uh, the book. So they really are rivals, rivals absolutely contiguous in time and both pushing for some sort of political power and recognition of their ideas. The ideas that Hitler's putting forward are racial dominance by one country, the very opposite, obviously, of what Kutin Hukulagi wants, which is a peaceful accumulation of the, the, the spirit of Europe in one political form by everyone's consent. He wants all these nations, now nearly 30 of them in Europe at the end of that First World War, nearly 30 states, just about what we've got now, <laughs> coming together by consent to create a union. Well, he, uh, I, I won't go into all the details of this. He has a, a, a startlingly good first marriage to the leading actress on the Vienna stage. They move into this fantastic flat, which had been the Cistercian Prior's residence until he decided he could motor in from the Abbey every day and didn't need the residence. And so he and his wife got this cheap because the Chancellor asked for it, which is very nice. Um, and it had its own private chapel and it was well appointed, four servants on ground floor and he, it was the embassy of Pan Europa as it were in Vienna. It hardly needed an embassy as well as having offices right next door to the chancellor in the Hofburg, which was the main administrative center of Vienna. So this man was right in the middle of the stream for Germanic speaking world, pressuring uh, with his new ideas, putting intellectual debate on the on the spot people had to come to terms with this way of looking at how to deal with Europe but we all know the story of Hitler he got to power in 1933 he annexed Austria in 1938 and this plaque for those of you who read German is attached to that that flat the picture of which I've shown you and it says on the night of the 11th to 12th of March 1938 uh, he and his wife fled from this uh, this house in the prelatura of the Heiligenkreuzerhof uh, and uh, had to flee from the occupying troops of National Socialist Germany. Uh, and it was put up there in 2012. So the memory of this is still fairly fresh in, in Vienna. Uh, th this man led an extraordinarily adventurous life. And when I put this one up, it might surprise you to find this in a story about uh, Europe's past, but it isn't if you, you, you all know the film Casablanca, I'm sure just quick memory of this. There's a love triangle between the three people who are in the front of this poster. Uh, Dirk Bogart, uh, Ingrid Bergman, and Paul Henri. And Kudenhof Kalegi is the model for the character that Paul Henri played, which was Victor Laszlo. That's the husband of Bergman, who's technically at the beginning of the film, he's in a concentration camp and he escapes uh, and upsets what's a growing love relationship between Bergman and Bogart. And they all finish up in Rick's bar in Casablanca, where Paul Henri leads a stirring singing of the Marseillaise that drowns out the German attempt to sing Die Wacht am Rhein. So the great resistance hero is surviving in semi-neutral territory, but has to escape, but he has to get the love triangle right. And of course, the film is, gets the love triangle right. He flies off to neutral Lisbon as the last shot in the film, which is lovely. It also ties in with where who Kalegi, not surprisingly, was flying out of Lisbon to try and get to free New York, which was a lot safer than staying in Europe. The Nazis were on his trail. The Gestapo had driven only a few miles behind him down the road to Bratislava when they came in in 1938, and they weren't, weren't going to let him survive in Lisbon, even as a neutral country. So he had to get out. And he's spirited away in part by the Americans, I imagine, uh, here I'm exploring a bit and it's not quite so textually supported. This man was the first president of the, uh, the big, uh, just a minute, let me get the, the not the Gulbenkian Foundation, but the uh, notes here. One moment, the foundation. Here we are, Carnegie, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's in fact uh, a, a late Victorian. He's born in the 1860s, this man. His name is Nicholas Murray Butler. You wouldn't know of him, but he was on the presidential ticket in 1912 in America for the Republicans, not as the president, but as the vice president. He was the number two on the ticket. Uh, he didn't get elected, but fair enough, but he had very, very influential roles and access to stacks of money in America. And I think that's how Kutin Hukalagi and his family managed to get out. Murray Butler was very strong in the educational world as well. And he not only was international relations and the promotion of peace 
hence a big interest in Europe, especially after the First World War. But he was also strong in education, and he ran one university in New York, and a friend of his ran the other one, the New York University. And he paid for a professorship for Tudnu Kalagi, who sat out the war working in New York University. And basically what he was doing was pushing American opinion in favor of the, first of all, Britain, before America even came into the war, he was pushing hard for America to come into the war. And then when it was in the war, uh, trying to get common war aims between Roosevelt and Churchill for the end of the war. And that didn't work all that well because Churchill, and he had a hot line to Churchill, um, saw things in a more antagonist, antagonistic way vis-a-vis -vis Russia than did Roosevelt. Roosevelt knew that Russia had to be on board to win the war, and he wasn't going to do very much to rock Stalin. In fact, he was going to do nothing to rock Stalin. Churchill knew that after the war, there was going to be an almighty barrier between what Russia stood for and what the Western democracies stood for. And it was only when Roosevelt died and was, was succeeded by this man, Harry Truman, uh, that that awareness clicked in to the American administration. So it wasn't until 1945 that the Americans took seriously the prospect that there was going to be a power vacuum in Europe that had to be filled somehow. Churchill had already been preaching the need for a Council of Europe, in 1943 broadcast world broadcast of everyone who picked it up. And 1943, a few weeks later, Kudnu Kalagi has a big conference in New York at which they conclude there must be something like a Council of Europe after the war, very similar lines. And they draft a constitution for this Council of Europe, this um, United States of Europe in embryo. Uh, and that to Harry Truman is music to his ears. In fact, he's on the record as saying, ah, oh, the United States of Europe, that's an excellent idea quite different from Roosevelt, quite different. But you can see with that sort of support and his um, Secretary of State, George Marshall, uh, who's the man behind the Marshall Plan, the, the reconstruction of Europe economically, uh, Kutenhoof is on a winning wicket at the end of the war. So he's got American support and he's got a hotline to this man who needs no explanation to this audience at all, I'm sure. This man loses the 45 election, you know that very well, and he's out of power until 1951, the second election in 1951. And in those five or six years, apart from being extremely depressed at losing power, which is quite obvious, and being exhausted from the work in the war, he's casting around for a new role. And the role that he takes is not just the liberator of Europe, but the man who's going to unite Europe. Now, that unite gets clarified in the early post-war years by things like the coup in Prague, which means that Czechoslovakia is not going to be in the Western half, right? That's taken by the communists, by a very clear division of Germany, a hardening of the line between the Russian and the Western allied parts of Germany. So it's not going to be all of Germany either. Uh, a coup in Poland, or effectively a coup in Poland, and make sure it's the communist committee that runs Poland and not the free Pole committee that has a chance in Poland of surviving even. Um, so the line gets very clearly drawn. The, the Europe that Churchill was able to do something for is Western Europe. Much less than his early imaginings and when he first got in touch with Kudenhoof, Kalergi, or the pair of them palled up in the 30s, um, which was a bigger Europe. It was that Europe of the map that I showed you. By this time, we're squashed in Europe into Western Europe. But he does a lot in Western Europe. This is the next big event. This is the Congress in The Hague, uh, or I should preface this first of all, um, when Churchill makes his first big post-war speech on Europe in Zurich in 1946, uh, he's had lunch with Kudenhu Kalergi just a week beforehand on the shores of Lake Geneva where he's recuperating and doing some nice watercolor painting, or oil paintings rather, of the, the lapping water on the lakeshore. Um, they have a lovely lunch. Uh, and when Churchill gives his speech in Zurich, he says, how much he owes to Kudenhoof Kalergi and the Pan-Europa movement between the wars, explicitly stated there. So of course, Kudenhoof is in seventh heaven. He's going to do whatever he can for, for Churchill now. And Kudenhoof, who's over there on the very far left, you see someone looking slightly upwards rather than towards Churchill. That's Kudenhoof with the uh, slightly Japanese face. He was described as 
slit-eyed by a commentator who was also sitting on this panel, uh, not in view, I'm afraid, just behind Churchill, Denis de Rougemont, who was a commentator of the time and a great cultural historian, described him as, him as slit-eyed Kudenhove. Um, but Churchill is here in this second speech, not the one in Zurich, but the one in The Hague in May 1948 at the great founding the Congress of Europe that essentially founds, it doesn't technically found it, but it boosts the European movement. Uh, previously that had been founded in the uh, Albert Hall by Churchill uh, and one or two others, largely on the conservative side, he couldn't get much Labour support for it, um, but he went on trying hard to get cross-party support, but it was difficult to be cross-party and still support Churchill because he was growing, dare I say, more anti-socialist, uh, as it were, by the year. Um, in parallel with this support for Churchill, couldn't have Kalergi, and I show you here the place where it happened, uh, it's, it's, this, this is the Grand Hotel in, Grand Palace Hotel in Gestad, which is not far from where Kudenhoof had his little country house. And Kudenhoof managed to invite, to poll, first of all, 4,000 West European parliamentarians across the countries of Western Europe that were not communist, uh, a letter poll. So it took some months, but he got lots and lots of replies. And then invited a couple of hundred of the leaders of these parties to come to this place and set up the European Parliamentary Union, the EPU. Um, many of you may know about the IPU, the International Parliamentary Union, this subset, as it were, is quite independent body, a new initiative by Kudenhoof Kalegi, and it met, met three or four times every six months or so for the next two or three years, and it was A, in favour of having a parliament for Europe, number one in its agenda, number two, that parliament should write a constitution for Europe, and number three, their aim was the federal United States of Europe. Those are really the three key headings. And they all spring from this fertile brain of Kudnov Galagi and his organizing ability. He's incredibly charismatic, fantastically well networked, works like a demon, uh, has a very active wife doing this with him too, very, very keen support. And he charms just about everybody. Uh, one of the people he couldn't charm and didn't get on with is this man who, if you like, represents the alternative tradition. I guess many of you will recognize him. It, it's uh, Jean Monnet. Uh, and just a year after the establishment of the Council of Europe and everyone congratulating Kudenhoof Kalergi because this is what his movement wanted. It's from the Pan Europa Times and also the EPU wants a parliament for Europe. And there is one attached to the, uh, to the, Europe, to, to the Council of Europe. Um, as you heard indeed with our previous speaker, is a member of it. He's, he comes from, from the Alliance Party in Northern Ireland to be uh, one of the UK's delegates in the parliament there. But that parliamentary assembly was uh, shackled, if you like, shackled at birth by the British who basically wrote the treaty uh, and restricted to being what uh, the foreign secretary at the time, Bevan, described as a talking shop because the Brits were in the chair for drawing up this new organization, and they did not want to lose national sovereignty to the people who had either been conquered or had been dubious, like France, I mean, half and half, as it were, conquered or complicit, or, well, some of them were free, but he was a difficult man, wasn't he? We'll come to him next. Um, but they, they, or the others, they'd freed anyway. I mean, the, the Dutch and the, the Belgians and the Luxembourgers, I mean, oh, and then the Italians, well, of course, they'd been both ways, hadn't they? Weren't they? Whose side were they on? And from the British point of view, the notion of going into, into close alliance that would lead to sharing sovereignty with the people who just emerged from that sort of war, which wasn't our sort of war, we weren't invaded, we were never occupied, we won, right? That was still unthinkable, just unthinkable. And to Churchill, obviously with the empire passed, with the development of the Commonwealth, yes, but the empire passed in particular, it was certainly unthinkable. He wanted something that held Britain and the continent together, but that didn't merge us with them. We couldn't merge with them because we, we just were different. We were different. But this man saw there were ways of doing it if you just concentrated on something small and specific. If you didn't say, let's merge, you didn't ask for the pooling of sovereignty. You said, 
coal and steel is something we have to manage. Now let's see how we manage it. And what came out of that was in fact a high authority and he himself declared when the high authority actually came into being, now there is no more German, French, Benelux coal and steel, there is only European coal and steel. That's his words, a uh, slight paraphrase, but that's the meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't say up front, that's what we want. He didn't say, we want you all to pool your sovereignty. And then we get around to sorting out coal and steel first and then other things afterwards. He said, no, let's do this one first. And then we'll go with what became the community method. We will identify those shared interests, which we can achieve through small steps. Europe will not be built with grand declarations and a big decision. So his approach is quite different to Kudnukalagi, who says, it's the map of the world, mates. Look at it. You've got Russia, China, Britain, the British Empire. You must stand up and be Europe. Otherwise, you just won't count. And he says, no, build up to it, build up through lots of little steps. And it's remarkably practical and good. And it's got us to the EU where we are, um, and perhaps further than he might have imagined. But for Kutnu Kalergi, that just wasn't the way. And the two of them, there's a long story, and I won't go into it now, but they, they'd known each other from the 20s, and it wasn't going to work between them in personality terms. What worked in personality terms for Kutnu Kalergi was Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle came as an outsider back into this game as well, having held on for the free French outside Europe most of the time, most of the war. Um, and with Charles de Gaulle, he could talk the same language about grandeur for Europe, about a leading role for France, about the need for leadership, whatever that meant at the time, um, and about impatience with the supranational appointed bureaucratic Brussels story, which wasn't really doing the big things. It was doing the little things, but not the big things for him. And de Gaulle, as you know, patently had a strong relationship with the British, but it was a rather antagonistic relationship with the British and twice vetoed our, our entry. To be fair to Kudenhoof Kalergi, he was with him for the first veto, but for the second one, he counseled him beforehand not to veto again. Uh, and although he had a very close relationship to the general and was one of his advisors, or unofficial advisors, um, de Gaulle didn't listen to him that second time. Anyway, all these things come to an end, even my talk comes to an end, and that is a grave. And de Gaulle died in 1970, uh, lost power in 69, died in 70. One of his last acts was to sign his memoirs, um, signed in the front cover of his book, um, to my esteemed, highly esteemed friend uh, and colleague, um, Kuden of Kalegi, or something, some phrase like that. And Charles de Gaulle's widow sent this on to him after her husband's death because her husband had been too, too weak to pack it up and send it. Um, but barely two years later, our man also died and he's buried here at the end of the garden of his Swiss country house. It's now a separate little private ceremony, cemetery. Um, and in the shed at the far end, rather oddly, is his first wife, who was the love of his life, died in the early 50s. And next to him here is his second wife, who was in fact an invalid for at least half their marriage. And, and it wasn't really a very fulfilling marriage, I think, for either side. And the third wife led the ceremony that actually interred him here in 1972. So there we are. That's the book. If you want to go and look for it or ask for it in good bookshops. Um, the questions he's putting to us today are about leadership. They're about identity. Who is a European? Who can call themselves a European? Can you tie that identity with your national one or not? And if you are European, why aren't we doing something more about it than we're doing at the moment? Why is Europe half a currency, half a foreign policy, quarter of an energy policy, some climate policy. You've got to scratch around a bit. Very little of it, bar the internal market, is full. And even that's not really full for services. It's full for, for goods. But services, we're still a long way off. So he wanted the lot and wanted it early and immediate. He wanted intellectual honesty about what you're doing. Jean Monnet wanted the small steps that eventually create solidarity. This man said, in the long run, you're dead. There you are. Thank you.